A very good evening to everyone. Today is March 18th, 2022. Do you find anything peculiar about this day? Well, two years back, this was probably the last normal week of our life. And then COVID happened. But thankfully, today we have vaccines that protect us from the deadly effects of this virus. Vaccines have truly become our savior. But hey, have you wondered what exactly a vaccine is? Who developed these magic liquids? Curious to know? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the world of molecular medicine. Today, we at Amrita Center of Amrita Center of Nanosciences and Molecular Medicine are extremely delighted to host this webinar on molecular and nanomedicines, exploring the new horizons of interdisciplinary healthcare. So here, hereby, I welcome our amicable audience, that is our students, parents, and teachers who are present here. Being the only and the first university to offer an undergrad program in molecular medicine, we receive a plethora of questions regarding the growing potential of this field. So we hope that this webinar serves you well. Before we begin, uh, let's invoke divine blessing. So I request Bhumika B, BSc Molecular Medicine, Batch of 2021, to render the prayer. Jaya Muthavala Varakundala Vatim Tejo Mahim Naishtiki Snitham Panka Vilokini Pagavati Mandas Midasri Mukhi Patsalyam Redavarshini Sumaturam Sangirtana Lapini Shyamam Gim Madhusitha Suktim Amritan and Om Namah Shivaya. Hey, audience, I'm a little envious of you today. You know why? Because here is a panel of eminent scientists who are ready to take us into the world of molecular medicine. Today, we have with us four dignitaries, three with me on the panel and one speaker directly joining us live from the US. So let me introduce you to them one by one. A celebrated scientist who features among Stanford University's top two person scientists in the world, Dr. Shantikumar V. Nair is the director, Amrita Center of Nanosciences and Molecular Medicine, also Dean Amrita Vishwavidya Prison. Professor Nair completed his IIT, uh, completed his BTech from IIT Bombay, and then went ahead to secure uh, MTech and then a PhD from Columbia University. Among the many accolades attached to his name, he has also received the Presidential Young Investigators Award from American President Ronald Reagan and also Sienna Rao Nanosciences Award for his outstanding contribution in the field of nanosciences research and development. Then we have with us Professor Krishna Kumar Meni, who is a distinguished scientist of clinical proteomics. He also has to his credit several years of academic and research experiences from countries like USA, Japan and Australia. Then we have with us Professor uh, Sahadev Shankarappa, who is both a medical scientist and also a medical doctor. Before joining our center, he was under the tutelage of eminent and renowned scientists like uh, Robert Langer at MIT and also Daniel Cohen at Howard. I'm also extremely delighted to welcome our alumna, Dr. Sukitishri uh, Vijay Rajaratnam, uh, who completed her PhD from our center and then is now pursuing postdoctoral research at Washington University. So I welcome all of you to this session, sir. Uh, welcome, sir. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, before we move ahead into the session, I would like to remind all you curious souls that our panel is would love to answer your questions. So please post your questions in the chat box and get it answered by them right away. So don't miss this golden opportunity. Now let's dive into the session. So my first question is to Shanti, sir. Sir, you started this center that is India's first nanobio center, Amrita Center for Nanoscience and Molecular Medicine, about 16 years ago. And today we are truly creating products, impactful and innovative products that are beneficial to the society. 
So could you introduce us to the world of molecular medicine and also tell us the relevance of this field in today's day and age? Thank you, Anjita. First of all, my warm welcome and uh, to all of you young future scientists uh, who are eager to know about this new cutting edge field of molecular medicine, which is really what it is. As you know, during the Corona era, India became the vaccine capital of the world and developed new vaccines like nano vaccines and supplied them to the rest of the world. And this cutting edge field of molecular medicine is largely responsible for this very rapid progress that has happened recently in India. So let me give you a little capsule of what uh, molecular medicine is. You've all heard of molecular pathogenesis. Now that's like a big sounding word, but that means molecules that are responsible for causing diseases. So there are two types of molecules. One is molecules that we get from the environment into our body. Second is molecules or so-called bad molecules that are created, biomolecules that are created within our own body, such as by mutations in our cells. And these molecules are responsible for various diseases that we suffer in this world. So if we can understand how these molecules actually cause diseases, what are the mechanisms by which these molecules cause diseases, then we can go ahead and diagnose these molecules and treat these molecules so we can develop therapeutics that are based on the molecular signatures of individuals. So that is a field that is we are soon coming upon, which is a field of personalized medicine, which requires us to understand the molecular signatures of people and then align that to targeted therapies, which target those specific molecules uh, and diagnose them and treat them. Now, to do that, uh, we have to develop new drugs. So the field of molecular medicine also involves drug discovery and drug development. And these drugs are developed uh, by targeting them to these specific bad molecules. And drug development involves a lot of bioinformatics and computer sciences and artificial intelligence to be able to look at the structure of these drug molecules and develop these drugs for application to therapy. A second aspect also which is interesting is that we can train our own immune system to recognize these bad molecules or molecular targets and be able to treat and to be able to get rid of these diseases by the body's own immune mechanism. So this is called molecular immunotherapy. So understanding molecular medicine gives us a whole host of arsenal to be able to deal with diseases and diagnostics. A second aspect of molecular medicine, which I want to point out, is basically molecular regenerative medicine. So we need to be able to treat uh, damaged tissues, or damaged organs, and we can regenerate these organs. Today, for example, in our labs, we can print tissues using live cells. So it's called bioprinting. And we can, in the future, and not too far into the future, we can print whole organs. We can print liver, we can print the heart using live cells and extracellular molecules. And so we are really in, a, in an era, exciting era, where we, if we understand how these molecules work, we can have a very innovative process of developing new therapies and diagnostics. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you for taking us to the fascinating world of molecular medicine. So my next question is to you, sir, there, sir. Uh, so your academic, portfo uh, your academic portfolio is a unique blend of 
different and varied degree. Like you have an MBBS and then an MPH, which is a Master of Public Health, and then you have a PhD. So could you tell us your molecular medicine story? Well, thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> before I start, uh, this is such a such a wonderful occasion. So we are sitting in this this very nice webinar with I understand that there's so many of you have logged in a uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, but what, what a wonderful occasion to get this all this information here right on on your YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here as well. Um, so to to answer that question, maybe I'll take it in two parts. Uh, maybe I can give you guys an idea of what a specific particular uh, um, idea that we are working on. Uh, and then I'll try to connect how I got there trying to work on such projects. Now, one of the things that we are working on in the lab has to do with developing a synthetic nerve. Yeah, it's a it's a nerve electrode, but we look at it in terms of a of a synthetic nerve. Now, why is this important? Now, if you think about it, um, a lot of people um, have certain injuries that causes them to lose their limbs, hands, legs. So these people need help. For example, uh, just in India, now our government data shows that about four and a half lakh people went through uh, road traffic accidents. Now that's quite a lot. And then if you can think about the numbers, that are involved who might actually lose their lives are quite high. Now, you might also have heard of um, the F1 Formula driver, Formula race driver, Michael Schumacher. So he was involved in a skiing accident and, and remains in a paraplegic state, and there's, a, there's injury to the nervous system. So, so these cases require special uh, intervention. And one intervention is uh, that they sometimes need prosthetic devices. So these are machines, I can say, that are associated with the human body, and we can move those prosthetic devices the way we want to help us in, in movement. Now, um, a lot of work is being done on this. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, Elon Musk, who's the CEO of Tesla. Um, he has many companies, and one of them is Neuralink. Uh, this is a company that uh, looks at trying to interface um, machines with the brain signals. In fact, just in January, some of you might have seen a, a YouTube link there where they, there was this very cute monkey that was playing a video game with his mind. So that is quite fascinating to see how, how machines can be controlled by nerve signals. But there are challenges. It, it, looks, it looks fantastic on, on YouTube and when you read about it, but there are a lot of challenges. Now, the challenge is trying to interface the machine with our nervous system. How do we do that? Now, what we are doing in the department is trying to develop a synthetic nerves with such machines. Now, there are, as I said, there are several challenges. Uh, one of few challenges is how do we figure out um, what proteins are involved in having these synthetic nerves attach to, to the real nervous system? Are, is there an inflammatory response involved? How do we mitigate this, these inflammatory responses? Now, if at all the nerve does connect to the machine, the RG signals okay, can we use these signals to use for prosthetic devices? So there are many, many of these questions that require a whole lot of expertise related to uh, molecular sciences. And that's where an expert in molecular medicine comes in, tries to understand the problem, and tries to put these things together. And so that's that's something very fascinating and, and how things might work in the future. Now, how did I get here? So for many of you who may be uh, exactly in the same position where I was after my 12th grade, this might, this might help. Um, I had a predilection to biology, but at that time, I was not lucky as some of you guys here who would sit in a uh, look, sit in a webinar and listen to a webinar and get information out. So I had to take the traditional route and and I entered medicine. 
So after I got into medicine, finished my medicine, there was always this need to do something different. So that's when I went to do my master's in public health. But I joined the research. So that's where um, I was doing but I got hooked to research then. So then I went on to do a PhD in neuroscience where we looked at how molecules released in the brain during exercise helped uh, nerve problems in diabetes patients. So there was a lot of molecules. We had to study deeply into the molecules and see how it affected. Now, after that, I went to MIT to to understand what delivery systems, how drugs can be delivered to the nervous system to prolong their use and how to produce long anesthetic So I've come through a circuitous route. So the point I want to make is here we have a very nice subject that kind of encompasses many of these, these ideas and brings it all together. So in molecular medicine, we address all these problems and try to solve um, these these medical issues and problems, challenges that are facing that are that we are facing, and trying to come up with a problem, uh, trying to come up with a solution for the problem. So, uh, in conclusion, I would say that molecular medicine is something that is going to play a large role in the way we approach medicine and its uh, solutions that uh, we're going to put forth to healthcare in the future. So, so that's how I think. That would be nice. Uh, thank you, Sardis, sir. Thank you for that uh, clear and meaningful response as two parts. And uh, thank you for giving your insights on molecular medicine. And also your story is truly impactful. Uh, it uh, inspires us to carve our own path and ju not just follow the crowd. So uh, coming to my third question, uh, the question is to you, Krishna Kumar, sir. So, sir, as a leading neuroscientist in the country, you have developed or are developing products, impactful and innovative products. So, uh, especially in the arena of medical health, medical research. So, could you tell us how particularly molecular medicine has helped you in developing these products? Uh, thank you, Anjita. And uh, you have already heard uh, uh, the speech by Shanti sir in which he has mentioned the word drug. So, I think I'll start from the drug you know so i'm in my hand you can see here um, <laughs> uh, can you focus <laughs> a small pill here, okay you know and have you i mean you I, i'm pretty sure that uh, most of you at one point in your life have taken uh, pills and the thing is that you know that you know when you when you have a headache for example you know, you end up having a paracetamol. But have you ever thought where this, how this drug came to existence? Or have you ever thought, you know, the history behind this drug? In fact, if I, if I show you again, this is a bunch of organic molecules. This is a bunch of organic molecules. And this has been converted into a medicine format. So you have organic molecules in a medicine format. There you go. Here is the molecular medicine for you. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that when you swallow a pill, you are actually swallowing a big endeavor or a big task that is accomplished by molecular medicine over a period of 15 or 20 years. Welcome to the world of molecular medicine. Now, you may, <laughs> it doesn't end in here. I mean, it's, it sounds very interesting, but it doesn't end in here. What happens is that if you look at you, as you sit there relaxing, you can see you are also a bunch of organic compounds, but with the different complexities. For example, since you have done plus two, you know that, you know, you have done, uh, you have looked at a cell, for example, and uh, the cell has got a cell membrane and a nucleus. You look deep into it. What do you see? You will see that it is composed of a bunch of organic molecules. But in your system, these molecules exist in harmony. So you look perfectly all right. When there is a turbulence happens, and depending upon the level of turbulence, you start to experience difficulties or you become from a normal ease situation to dis ease situation. So therefore you call it as a disease. So you are actually treating 
and a bunch of organic molecules with a different level of complexity with another organic molecule. So what is exactly molecular medicine? Like Sandhizar has told before, and I'm just repeating it again, that molecular medicine is molecular signatures that are associated with the disease. And not only that, the use of these signatures, that means the turbulence I mentioned, use of these signatures in developing diagnosis or therapy. Um, to give you a simple example in uh, some of the things which I am doing because we are into drug developing, etc., particularly answering to uh, Ms. Anjida's question. See, I work on in the field of multiple sclerosis, which in short it is called as MS. MS is a disease which affects millions of young adults worldwide, which means that people who are at the age of 25, they can catch it. Remember, there is no cure. And what is this disease? This is an autoimmune neurodegenerative disorder. To simplify it, your own soldier you prepare to defend is, is attacking you. That's what's called autoimmunity. Neurodegeneration means the brain cells in your brain is being degenerated. So you may not be able to do your normal <coughs> task, actually speaking. So when such degeneration happens, say for example, if you want if you want to move your legs, you know, that the message has to be sent from the brain all the way down to the tip of the toe. And apparently the message is not reaching there. So we call it as paralysis. Current treatment options are like, you know, if you look at, you can see because there is no cure and there's only disease modifying therapies. DMDs otherwise called. This is modifying therapy means you may give a drug or you may take a drug and this drug will eventually, you know, suppress your symptoms for a while so that you don't get a huge attack from the disease or huge attack from your own soldiers or, or in other words, autoimmune attack won't happen. So what we did is that some of our previous publications have identified a molecule which is an immunomodulatory. That means a molecule which can modulate the soldiers who are going to attack you. So we took this molecule, this is a protein, and we computationally modeled it. So there are, this is what Shantisar was talking to you, that bioinformatica. So as computational, computationally modeled it. So you can see the whole structure of the molecule, okay? And then you come up with a, an organic molecule, like what I said in this drug, and try to stop its activity. Because of its activity, you are having this autoimmune attack. And we, by doing this procedure, we were able to identify a potent inhibitor, the small organic molecule. But having identified that molecule doesn't mean that we have achieved anything. So the next step is that we have to validate it. We call it as validation. That means you, know, you have to make sure that it is really working. So we use different, different techniques, which include, I don't want to elaborate too much, which include starting from biochemistry, proteomics, cell biology, molecular biology, bioinformatics, of course, and then uh, clinical pathology, immunology on top. Um, in addition to that, you can have physical techniques also. So you see that a pill, what I showed you before, that's what a huge, a big story to tell you. Big story to tell you. And it is composed of different, different, different disciplines. That is why it's called interdisciplinary course. You know, you may go take microbiology, you may take biochemistry. That is individual courses. But here you have interdisciplinary approach. So this is going to be the future of molecular medicine. So once again, welcome you to the molecular medicine. In addition to that, you are living in a COVID era, right? All of you are familiar with the PCRs and vaccines and vaccines and vaccines. So what are these vaccines actually? These are the same virus or part of this virus that is being put in your body. So why you do that? Because immune system, if it sees early enough, 
it will develop the soldiers against this virus. So that when the virus attack you, the real virus comes to you, there is no issue. You may get a mild symptom or sometimes you may not get any disease at all. That's the advantage. So here also you have immunology, molecular biology, microbiology, virology, you name it. So you can see that like that there are n number of examples I can tell you. Once again, welcome to the world of molecular medicine and thank you for watching. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your interesting response with uh, by taking a lot of interesting everyday examples so that the kids here or the uh, students here can understand it in a deeper, uh, simpler and more uh, meaningful way. So thank you, sir. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Sudhipashri. Um, uh, you finished your PhD here at Amrita Center of Nanosciences and Molecular Medicine and you work specially on resistance microbiome. So could you please tell me about how the academic and research training at the center has helped you in this um, in your successful career right now? And also if you could uh, give your insight into the molecular medicine program that is available at the center, then it could be really useful for the students watching. Hi, uh, thanks for the question. So I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate at Washington University in St. Louis, USA. So my current research is focused on Legionella pneumophila, which is a bacterial lung pathogen causing pneumonia. Before I moved to the US, I did my PhD in the lab of Dr. Raja Bishwas, who's a faculty member at Amrita. And uh, this was as a part of a PhD program in molecular medicine where I studied the bacterial cell wall and how it interacts with the human immune system. So it's always been my passion to be able to do research in this area to understand underlying genetics related to bacterial infection, et cetera. And it's my PhD training in molecular medicine at Amrita that's actually helped me launch my research career. So at Amrita, it's kind of different when you think about it. I received an education to understand the molecular aspects of medicine and biology, but along with an opportunity to actually do real research. So uh, I got access to cutting edge technology, which is available there. So you get a lot of resources and you have access to like really cutting edge technology, such as like flow cytometry, uh, electron microscopy, et cetera. So um, all this helped me actually secure research position. Another factor which was really important in this is the support, encouragement, and career guidance from the faculty at Amrita. So uh, these have been very instrumental in helping me secure a research position here and has so far helped me evolve in life to where I am right now. So when I think of Amrita, more than like it being just an alumni institution, I think of the faculty and my colleagues there as a family. And that relationship has lasted all the way till now. Like even after I graduated, I'm still in touch with them and they're always ready to help me when I need something. So that's the beauty about Amrita. It's more like a family. They don't treat you like a student. It's really like they, take, they treat you like a family. So uh, the reason I said this was so that you get a context of the research culture at Amrita, which is something very different from things that I've noted, noticed in other places. So that kind of culture does not exist even in the U.S., so like you're, you're, it's pretty much like an independent culture when you're in the U.S., whereas in Amrita, actually, you are treated like a family. You get so much more support, which actually helps you become a better scientist. Now, uh, regarding the scope of molecular medicine as subject, you have already heard three eminent scientists in the field talk. And by now, you know that the scope of it as subject is really vast. Molecular medicine has immense potential and the potential is so great that it could actually lead to making you the one designing a vaccine against a pandemic. Now that we have been through COVID, we all know how important a vaccine really is. Or you could be on the front, like actually designing a life-saving drug. So this makes molecular medicine one of those really exciting career choices that help you make significant contributions that impact people's lives. So that's the reason I believe molecular medicine is a good choice of education for young students like you to have a bright, successful future and completely focused on innovation. So it gives you like room to do what you want. Makes you like an independent scientist, helps you think, and you're on the front asking questions. So hence, I believe this is a good career choice 
And if anybody has any questions, I would like to answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for especially showcasing your passion for research per se. I'm sure uh, the students in the audience are very much inspired by listening to your story and also uh, get a real life uh, under, uh, exa you as a real life example would be a really uh, good example for them as well. So thank you so much. Uh, so Shanti sir, Krishna Kumar sir, sir. Mr. Sukita, uh, thank you for giving, uh, taking us to your individual sojourns with molecular medicine. I'm sure we are all inspired listening to all your stories. But I noticed that if there's one thing that stands out in your individual response, it is your drive, your passion towards your respective career. Uh, I have a lot of questions brimming in my mind right now. So audience, uh, if you have those questions, what are you waiting for? Please post your questions. Uh, so coming to one pertinent question that I have. Uh, Shanti sir, uh, so if a student chooses to study molecular medicine, what are the potential employment opportunities that are awaiting him or her? Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, molecular medicine is a field that has really quadrupled and quintupled in the last uh, few years. And during the corona period, it has really exploded in India today. If you look at the field of molecular medicine, the requirement for trained manpower in molecular medicine is somewhere in the order of five lakhs per annum in India alone. That's a very staggering number. And the kinds of industries that in looking to hire molecular medicine specialties are pharma companies. There are about 3000 pharma companies in India. India is the pharma capital of the world. There are 4,000 biotech companies that are also developing various molecular solutions uh, for, for healthcare. There are 4,000 startups. It's an amazing number. 4,000 startups in India. Young people who are uh, motivated enough to pursue their own careers by starting a company. And so the Opportunities are tremendous. The other aspect, as Dr. Krishnamar mentioned, is the computational part. Computational biology is a very critical part of molecular medicine. If we do whole genome sequencing so that we can identify what are the mutations that are causing some bad uh, molecular markers to be generated within the body, you need to do a lot of computational analysis. So many bioinformatic companies, and now there are dozens of bioinformatic companies in India that are hiring specialists like those trained in our programs. And also IT companies, generally IT companies are also hiring people with this kind of a specialization in bioinformatics uh, and with a scientific background. So the, the training that you will be getting is, is a very broad range of training. You would, uh, you would know how to do a full genome sequencing. You would learn how to edit your genes. You would learn how to do various biomolecular assays uh, that are required. You would do cell culture and cellular analysis in vitro. Uh, so. The, the depth and breadth of work that you'd be doing with exposure to molecular biology, biochemistry, uh, computational biology, and even to some extent engineering. If you are looking, as I said, at regenerative medicine, we are actually combining drugs with other biomaterials. And so there's a lot of expertise that is associated with engineering. That's why it's such an interdisciplinary field. So the opportunities are in all of these companies. However, some of you may be really interested in pure research and going into advanced research. Sukita Sri is now doing a postdoc uh, in uh, research and looking at more advanced aspects of molecular medicine. And that also is an area where there's a huge opportunities all over the world. Many good universities are looking for talented students in this cutting edge areas where we can look at the molecular aspects and develop new innovative uh, products. 
Wow, that means uh, there are immense possibilities of molecular medicine and molecular medicine does hold a key to a lot and many, many, many doors. Uh, so now it's time to open the forum to the audience's questions. Uh, I want to remind you again that if you have any questions, don't miss this opportunity and post your questions right away. Well, I have a bunch of questions with me right here. Mm -hmm. So I might start asking uh, you. These are the questions that you posted in the chat box. So I may start asking them one by one directly to our panel. Uh, so the first question that we have here is, uh, so what is the role of molecular medicine in cancer treatment? Okay, you want to start. <laughs> so the role of molecular medicine in cancer treatment, you know, I started with the drug actually and development of different drugs, you know, itself is a big achievement towards cancer treatment. And why do I say, why do I say that? Because again, all the cancer targets, if you look at, you will see that these are all proteins like the proteins which I told you before. And they all have developed inhibitors like what I mentioned to you before. So development of inhibitors, which will prevent the progression of the uncontrolled division of cell. What it means is that normally we have a very controlled division going on, but in cancer, these cells undergo rapid division and accumulate. That's why in a, in a particular way, you suddenly you start to see cell come, uh, developing and multiplying in a big way that you develop a tumor, you know, a bulge. So, in other words, you're basically targeting growth mechanisms. Of course, that's why you do see the side effects also because your cell, normal cells are also growing. So, the important thing is that you have to find a balance. So still we have so many different drugs available right now, but future uh, and I mean there's a lot of work has to be done to find out new and more beneficial drugs so that we can at least tie down this untra uncontrolled growth, in other words cancer, to have a better life. That's what I, what I could say. Okay. I'll just add yeah. to that. Uh, I'll just add to that. You know, a lot of cancers are caused by many genomic mutations, mm -hmm. which give rise to particular molecular markers, uh, which try to further the sustenance of these cancer cells and help them multiply and divide much more than any cell normally would. For example, brain tumor expresses particular markers like EGFR, which is a particular marker. Uh, which uh, allows these tumor cells to be much more invasive and much more aggressive. And when we are using molecular medicine, what we will say is, well, let's target that particular marker which is overexpressed on the cell and create a drug molecule that will go and attach itself to that particular marker. And then the drug molecules would enter the cells readily and be able to destroy the cancer cell. So unless we understand, you know, going all the way from genomics to particular protein markers to drug molecules, how they come together, that's what happens in tumors. And the other very interesting aspect today in molecular medicine for cancer is basically looking at uh, immunotherapy of cancer. How can we use the body to fight cancer on its own? How do we sensitize our immune system to particular molecular markers for cancer? And I think that's a very exciting field that is taking off in a big way. Okay, I think that answers it all. So we have another interesting question is, uh, is physics, chemistry, biology right to pursue this stream or which should we go for physics, chemistry, math and biology? That's a question. Go ahead. So I think um, math, I'm going to address the elephant in the room here. So math seems to be the one that that uh, kind of pivots a lot of people from taking biology and things because we've all been there. Uh, but I must add that math plays a huge role in pretty much everything in all aspects of science, be it medicine, regenerative medicine, the, you know, you have to understand the physics of it, the, the, the math behind it. But having said that, um, especially for this course, 
uh, I think it, it wouldn't matter which one you take because it's quite broad because some of the subjects we touch upon, there's a lot of choices you can go through in your career and even the basic subjects that we start off with. I don't think you would be at a disadvantage if you were to take either one of them. Uh, but however, having said that, my own personal uh, opinion is that math is quite important uh, because having been in a situation where I was afraid of math, I'm now in a situation where I appreciate math and look at the beauty of it in almost everything living. So, uh, so, so do try to look into that aspect as well. Um, but so, yeah, so that is that is what I think. Uh, uh, you and I think uh, data analysis is fundamental to any science. Mm. You cannot do data analysis without math. So I think you all need to have some background in math. I, I hope you are not going to get mental block against mathematics. You need statistics, you need data analytics. And if you are going to do a genomic analysis, you need to be able to do analytics. So uh, it's very important today in molecular medicine that we keep this interdisciplinary understanding and not say, well, I'm a biologist, I don't need to know any math. So I think it's important to recognize how uh, the importance of all these areas coming together. Uh, Sukhita Sri, you can jump in at any time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe I'll add something. Yeah. yeah, so I think, I mean, even if you haven't studied math, like if, you, if math isn't your favorite so far, I, re I don't think that should stop you from actually taking a career in molecular medicine. Because like, I mean, I think you'll realize the importance of math once you start with it. Like once you start your career, I feel like it'll be, it'll, you'll suddenly realize the importance and then you'll start like, accepting how important it was. And I don't think that's any reason to stop you from choosing a career. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have a recurring question here and the question goes on like this. I want to pursue, uh, I want to pursue in research line, but I'm hearing a lot that India has less scope regarding research. Is this true? Yeah. So, so maybe I can address this question about research scope in India. So all of us sitting here uh, did our um, education abroad. I did my master's and PhD in the United States. Dr. Shanti Nair did the same thing. He did his master's and PhD and he was teaching in the United States with the full research lab. I did my research there. Dr. Krishna Kumar did the same thing. We all came back. So uh, that would say something. Um, but research scope wise, um, yes, it is not as exuberant as you would see in, in, in the United States, for, for, for example. But here is something where things are developing. There's a lot of excitement about, about research. The government is, is, is supporting in, in many forms. There are a lot of funding, funding um, areas for students who want to do research. So I, I, I personally think think that is something that should be that should be highlighted that India is is a growing force in research, and and not get into the conventional uh, uh, thinking that we are still the research is nothing. I, I don't think that is that is true. So so for those of you who are thinking India is a, is a burgeoning economy, so once the the growth is going, obviously money is trickling into research, and 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 people in policy understand that. For a country to grow, research is quite important, and mm -hmm. India is at that threshold. So I think I think it is it is quite quite encouraging. The research scene seen as quite encouraging in India. That I'll also say, you know, research. If you ask me this question, or if any of you ask me this question twenty years ago, I would say yes. I I think you're right. I think the opportunities for research is still only developing in India. Definitely, that is not true today. I think there's a huge burst of research. If you look at the field of nanomedicine, we are number three in the world in nanomedicine publications. That is a statistic. That is a real statistic. And I mentioned the story of Corona, where it was India who innovated the vaccines that are being supplied to all over the world, except for the vaccines uh, by Pfizer and Moderna. India was one of the biggest innovators in vaccine. 
Uh, and that happens. It doesn't happen. And it was fast tracked in the matter of what, a few months as opposed to 10 years. So this capacity is there because of research. It doesn't happen magically. You don't get it by reading books. You cannot develop a vaccine like that. You have to do research. So India is a hotbed of research today. That's what I would say. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. I, maybe I can add a, a little bit more to it. Uh, this is why you are attending this uh, program because you have come to the right place because you can see in a single floor all the different equipments you would see anywhere in the world. Of course, you have to choose rightly, and that's why you are at Amrita. <laughs> that's all, all I have to do. <laughs> So okay. yeah, the scope for research in India is less, is an absolute myth, it's not true, it's a flourishing, uh, it's a flourishing career option and it's also flourishing in full swing in India, so that is not true. Uh, so now we have another question, uh, so what are the different courses which can be a biology or chemistry student? I think they are, they mean in terms with molecular medicine. Yeah, I think it's yeah, I know. same, yeah. Um, well, I mean, every course is different. I'm not saying that different courses, um, uh, you know, necessarily superior to other. What we are saying only is that uh, this particular course of molecular medicine is a very interdisciplinary course. It has molecular biology, it has biochemistry, it has genetics, and it has proteomics, and so many aspects that are, and microbiology, aspects that are coming together along with also computational biology, um, as opposed to some other more standard courses which are somewhat more monolithic, but that doesn't, I'm not saying anything is inferior or superior, but this is the trend today is, is courses that are more interdisciplinary in, in nature. Uh, thank you, sir. So I think we have some more questions. Uh, Ma'am, could you pass me those questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sashwati Ma'am. Yeah. So we have uh, some more uh, very interesting questions. Uh, so we'll uh, look into it. Uh, so the next question is, uh, so what are the streams to pursue masters after completing UG in molecular medicine? Okay. Um, molecular medicine UG is a start. It's not the end point, <laughs> okay? You, I would say that you really should pursue a PG in molecular medicine, at least a MSA degree, so that you have the wherewithal, and the skills and the training matured to a certain level, so that you can either go purely into research or you can go and contribute significantly to companies. Uh, so uh, I, I think that at least up to the end point, MS in molecular medicine should be looked at. Um, and if you decide to go further, naturally you'd be doing a PhD. At that point, you'll be looking at specific specialized applications of molecular medicine, developing some, maybe some new therapy, some new diagnostic, uh, and so on. So it's a field that, as I said, is not monolithic. It's a composite field of, of many different disciplines. So I would strongly suggest that when at this stage you should be looking ahead to at least a BSc and an MSc so that you can really jump out there and make a fantastic career for yourself. Um, Is that all? Uh, so the next question is one question that we have addressed already that what are the different career opportunities available in this field? I think uh, Shanti sir mentioned in detail about this. So we'll uh, quickly go to the uh, next question. Uh, so uh, are there a lot of colleges offering molecular medicine in this country as I'm from Orissa and do I have a choice somewhere close by? <laughs> um, there are not. Uh, we were the first in India to start a, a course in molecular medicine. I believe now there may be two others uh, that may be offering a course in molecular medicine. In the US, I know also there are courses in molecular medicine. For example, cellular and molecular medicine is offered by University of Arizona. We have a joint degree program with the uh, University of Arizona. Um, and I think maybe Sri, so you might comment a bit more on the U.S. situation with respect to molecular medicine. 
Uh, regarding the scope, I think, I think we have like uh, a... It need not be a particular degree program called all molecular medicine, mm -hmm. but I think uh, a training in that field, uh, I believe it's it's a lot of opportunities there. You can mention uh, that. Yeah, especially with uh, regard to Amruta, you have like access to such a large repertoire of faculty. So actually, like you have this opportunity to actually discuss all these fields, and then you can choose what you like. So it kind of kind of gives you. Uh, you don't really have to like uh, decide on something right away. So when you interact with all these people, you get to know all these fields of science. So you can choose, suppose you like neuromedicine, then you can choose a career in that particular field. So that's what yeah. I think. Yeah. I think, I, think, I think some of the students probably are like the question that came up from uh, Orissa. So just to reassure that we have students from almost everywhere in India. We have people from coming from, from Bengal, from all the way from the north. So, um, so that way, uh, even though we are probably, we are the first institute to actually offer this undergraduate course, the response has been so great so far for the past three years uh, that we have got responses from students from all over India. So I think that is something also for you to consider. Okay. That answers it all. Uh, so uh, the next question is a heartfelt question, which is, uh, what is the role of molecular medicine in vaccine discovery as I'm going through COVID? Oh, <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, well, you know, for example, how did we develop uh, develop uh, the COVID vaccine? Uh, and I think maybe my colleagues could expand on it if need, need be, but we have certain molecules that are or called receptors that are overexpressed on certain cells called ACE receptor, ACE2 receptor. And these viruses come and cling on to these particular receptors to be able to attack the cells. And so everything is mediated by these molecules. So if we can inhibit some of these receptors, or as uh, uh, Dr. Krishnamar said, uh, develop fragments of the viruses themselves to be able to sensitize the immune system uh, to be able to prevent the virus when they actually invade the system. Uh, these are all different ways that molecular tricks, you can say, or techniques that molecular medicine uses uh, to develop new vaccines. Um, I think uh, Shanti's side is pretty much it. And uh, the only thing which I could add is that uh, the same thing, because, uh, you know, if you develop this kind of fragments and you can also develop, identify potential sites, which other sites, which once it gets into the cell, you know, where it binds with the other organelles. And if you can block that, you can prevent again. Uh, the infection rate or I mean, the severity of the disease, etc. So there are so many ways. So what it tells again is that you have to know all these subjects in deep. So that's the time you started to, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, when you become conscious about many, many things, you it will reveal on its own. You know, that's a, that's a fundamental of it. So like Sukita Sri has uh, mentioned that once you come in here, don't make any any decisions now you come or come over here interact with us then automatically the flower will bloom <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you thank you so much sir so we have our next question which is uh, namaste sir how far are molecular medicines effective in treating genetic abnormalities especially muscular dystrophy dystrophy Okay. Uh, very specific so, so maybe I can yeah. I can yeah. start with that. Yeah. One. So muscular dystrophies. These are these are challenges to this generation because we do not have a cure. We also we know have small fragments of information on how to manage, but we are still in the dark. Uh, how molecular medicine helps is that we are in the process of identifying targets what genes are involved. Maybe um, reading up on this, it, what it tells us, the direction that we are going is probably towards gene therapy, especially for, for diseases such as such as these, where it's, it's very hard to 
uh, since there are multiple areas of, of uh, research that, that occurs on to understand how this particular gene causes this kind of a phenotype. So, so gene therapy is probably where we are looking at when we look at in terms of trying to understand and come up with a cure for diseases such as uh, muscular dystrophies. And Dr. KK, if you no, have... No, that's fine, that's fine. So yeah, that answers the question. So I'll add uh, yes. one quick thing to that, you know, I mean, in molecular medicine, uh, it, there's a lot of attention given to mutations and genetic abnormalities, which are the source of many diseases, including muscular dystrophy. And there are very new advanced techniques that are now coming into the picture called gene editing where you can cut out just those portions of the genome which are responsible um, by using a technique which has now become a very big thing. Uh, so there are now new tools and techniques, genetic tools and techniques at our disposal also now in the future as we move ahead to look at new ways to treat uh, genetic diseases. Okay. So I think that answers the question. So this is a recurring question in uh, the webinar, I guess. Uh, it's about, could you give us a career path to success after choosing UG in molecular medicine? Okay, I, um, maybe uh, Sukita, yeah, Sukita yeah. can talk about it a little. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's more like, um, how do you even define success? Like, <laughs> it's basically, and everything you can kind of realize what you like like it could be a specific field you like it could be some particular specific you want to work in so um if this you'll you'll get there eventually like where you want where there's something specific that you want to work on and then you look for other places like suppose you want to go abroad or something you start looking up universities and then figuring out where you want to do research and then like um you could actually apply for a position and it's You'll, you'll get a position easily because in Amrita, you're trained to actually do a lot of things. Like you're trained to give seminars, you're trained to write research articles. So all this training actually helps you um, make a good decision. And it kind of sets you, like puts you on track when you want to apply outside. And even like, suppose, even by the time you're already in a position, suppose after your um, PhD, let's say you go in a postdoc, you have been trained at Amrita all along to ask questions. And this training actually is useful because like when you get out of like your comfort zone back home and when you're somewhere else, you know, like you can survive because you're trained to ask questions, you're trained to think. And the faculty all along at Amrita have given you constructive criticism. They have encouraged you to think. So actually all this is helpful when you get a position somewhere else. I mean, I'm saying this based out of my experience. So that's it. Yeah, so I, I think that fundamentally, as I said earlier, don't stop with BSc. Keep going, at least get an MSc. And I, I think as Sukita said, fundamentally ask a lot of questions, you know, and probe and try to understand things. And that's what molecular medicine is all about, understanding things at a much deeper level so that we can come up with innovative solutions and interdisciplinary field, as we've been saying and over and over again. So you can branch off into many areas. If you really wanted to go only into bioinformatics or computer sciences, you can do that. Uh, so it has a lot of, if you want to go into drug development or drug discovery or even drug synthesis and molecular synthesis of new drugs and develop new formulations, you can do that, that'll be a bit more chemistry oriented. But the exposure that you get allows you to give, allows you to have a lot of options, mm -hmm. but at least go to finishing your MSc. That's what I would say. Okay, uh, so that brings me directly to the next question. Uh, so is this a specialization course or do I have a choice to opt out for something different for my PG? For you? PG. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, it's in my opinion, it's not a specialization course. This is a very interdisciplinary course. A specialized course is something in a very esoteric area, 
and uh, you are developing a high degree of specific knowledge on a specific narrow field. That's what is the definition of specialization. So this is not a specialization. This is a basic fundamental course where innovation is the key. And so I, I would not characterize at all as a specialization course. This is a course, is a basic course for today's modern healthcare arena. This is what you need, molecular medicine. It's, it's a basic course in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, uh, so we have the next question, which is uh, respected sir, is there a consideration to make molecular medicine a four year course due to the recent national education policy? very contemporary. And yeah. yeah, I think yeah. the national education policy is planning to switch it. Um, BSc four years, we are ready to go. That happens. Then you'll have a four year BSc degree in molecular medicine. Yay. <laughs> OK, uh, we have been doing molecular medicine at the PG level for the last 15 years. So it's not like we are just set up right now to do something new. You know, we, we started in 2006 with molecular medicine and the PG programs have been going on and it's only the UG program that has started two years ago. And and that's a phenomenal opportunity because now you can get into the track of it right after high school. OK, so that's the, the situation. I think that's a that's a very relevant mm -hmm. question because we just had a report today where the UGC has has pushed forward to a four year course. Yeah. I think we have since we are, as Dr. Nair said, we have been doing this for a while. And in fact, we have been talking that we have to be in um, in line with the new NEP policies, which is very student friendly. So I think that is that's just a matter of time where we examine that and, and modify our program to suit how those how those goals are. So if the policy is such, then we will go ahead with the four year yeah, program. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it's written. I mean, it's written very clearly in that uh, description what they gave uh, that, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, you can choose to exit from the course at any time. And at the same time, you are finishing a BSc honors in four years time and you don't have to do an MSc or masters. You can go directly to PhD. So you're actually saving time and look, Four years of exposure on molecular medicine will make you think and at the same time make you dis make a decision whether which career path you really want to go. That makes a, a huge difference. You know, so I think, you know, the opportunities are endless. Thank you, sir. I think this question is particularly because we saw your passion towards the field. So what according to you is the most exciting part about molecular medicine? Most exciting part. You don't have to choose, but you can say a exciting part. <laughs> I can maybe I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Um, for me, the most exciting part of molecular medicine is my molecular medicine students. <laughs> <laughs> it is fantastic working with working with the students who are interested, who are very interested. Of course, we have we have been doing research for a while. I have my own individual interests the neuro, neural sciences, neural engineering, where you bring in all these molecular principles. I love those. But at the end of the day, when I go home, what puts a smile on my face are my students. That's that's my passion, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll pass it on to you, Dr. I, I, I think I, I love cutting edge new ideas that I can explore. I've always been a scientific explorer and molecular medicine is, is a field that you can really do a lot of exploration. And I think um, that's what I love, love about it. A lot of questions you can ask, a lot of answers to hunt for. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's fundamentally, you know, I always tell everybody, it's fundamentally chemistry of living things, you know. Basically, it's that it, it boils down to that. So in, in you can do a whole lot of things. You can do a whole lot of things, ask a lot of different questions. And and uh, you know and, and the thing is that when you ask such questions, you know that's what Sa uh, Dr. Sahadev has put forth that you know you feel so comfortable that you know people are understanding what we are trying to say, and they are communicating back to us, 
and 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 that that's what a course is all about you know and here we are and and this is the place for you sukita <laughs> what's the passion <laughs> yeah i wasn't <laughs> Uh, I didn't exactly have a passion when I walked in to do my PhD, but over time, like I understood how much it was more like realization of how much I liked to understand the bacterial genetics, how infection processes work, and stuff like this. But this is something I realized over time, like throughout my PhD. And then, like after I got here, like um, I mean, I first chose a postdoc in malaria, and then I figured out I didn't like it as much, and then I moved back to bacteria. So it's something. It's more like I think these kind of decisions keep changing over time, and you figure out how much you like something or you don't like something, and your specific research interests over time. So it's not something that you have to decide today. Your interests can change in the next span of few years, okay. and depending on uh, that, you can choose your career. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, that was the final question that we had. Right? Uh, we had a very interesting and varied uh, number of questions that came our way. So thank you for posting in your questions. So with that, we come to the end of the national seminar. And before we close, I want to take a moment and express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone present here. Firstly, to the panel, eminent scientists in the panel who took us on their truly uh, inspiring stories and also gave us a clearer picture about molecular medicine and its growing potential. Next, I want to thank our technical and non-technical team who worked tirelessly for the uh, effective um, execution of this program. And finally, I want to thank all of you in the audience, the students, the teachers, the parents, uh, everyone, uh, because without you, this wouldn't have been possible. So thank you so much uh, for joining in. And as an end note, I want to tell all the young minds out here that never stop learning, never stop exploring, and just stop following the crowd. And interestingly, in 2021, we launched a social media campaign called hashtag stop following the crowd. Uh, to encourage people to pursue their passion, even though it might be the roads less taken by. So uh, to all your students out there, remember, stop following the crowd and let passion be your compass in life. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you so much for coming into this national webinar on molecular and nanomedicine, exploring uh, horizons in interdisciplinary healthcare. But, and before uh, signing off, I would want to tell you that if you want to have, if you're curious enough and if you want to have more information about the center, the research that we do and the various programs that we offer, there's a link to the website in the description box. You may check it uh, there. All the information is just one click away. So finally, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining to this webinar. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for good coming. Night. Thank you. Thank you.